Άρχεται η δημόσια συνεδρίαση. Πάνω σε οριότατα αρχιεμαντρίτη η ΟΗΛ εκπρόσωπε το Αρχιεσκόπου Αθηνών και πάει σε Ελλάδος. Αξιότιμοι συνάδελφοι ακραϊμαϊκοί προσεκλημένοι μας, εκλεκτοί. Η Ακαδημία Αθηνών υποδέχεται σήμερα με ιδιαίτερη τιμή και χαρά τον κύριο Ρόμπερτ Όλιβερ Ρίτσι, καθηγητή στο Τμήμα Επιστήμης των Υλικών και Μηχανικής του Πανεπιστημίου της Καλιφόρνιας στο Μπέκλεϊ των ΗΠΑ, ως ξένο εταίρο της, στο γνωστικό αντικείμενο της Επιστήμης των Υλικών. Ο καθηγητής Ρίτσι την χάνει διεθνού αναγνώρισης για την έρευνά του στο πεδίο της θράψης και της κόπωσης ενός μεγάλου εύρους υλικών. Τα τρέχοντα ενδιαφέροντά του εστιάζονται στη μελέτη των μηχανικών ιδιωτήτων της αντοχής και φθοράς των υλικών. Είναι ξένος εταίρος της Βασιλικής Ακαδημίας και της Βασιλικής Ακαδημίας Μηχανικών του Ηνωμένου Βασιλείου, της Εθνικής Ακαδημίας Μηχανικών των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών της Αμερικής, της Ακαδημίας Επιστημών της Ρωσίας και της Βασιλικής Σουηδικής Ακαδημίας Μηχανικών. Παρακαλώ τον ακαδημαϊκό κύριο Μανουήλ Κδούτο να προσέρθει στο βήμα και να προσιάσει το έργο του νέου συναδέλφου. Θα ακολουθήσει ομιλία του κύριου Ρόμπερτ Όλιβερ Ρίτσι με θέμα «Fracture Resistance in Natural and Engineering Materials». Αντοχή θασμάτων φυσικών και μηχανικών υλικών. Μια πρόχειρη μετάφραση. Ευχαριστώ. Πάνω σε ολογιότητα, ο Αρχιμαντώτη Ιωήλ, εκπρόσωπη του Αρχιεπισκόπου Αθηνών και Πάσης Ελλάδος, αξιότιμοι συνάδελφοι, ακαδημαϊκοί, εκλεκτοί, προσκεκλημένοι. Έχω την υψίστη τιμή και ιδιαίτερα ευχαρίστηση να παρουσιάσω το νέο ξένο εταίρο της Ακαδημίας Αθηνών, τον καθηγητή της έδρας H.T. and Jesse Chua, της Επιστήμης Υλικών και Μηχανικής και Μηχανολόγων Μηχανικών του Πανεπιστημίου της Καλιφόρνιας στο Μπέρκλεϊ, έναν εξαιρετικό επιστήμονα ε, κατά την αποψινή επίσημη αποδοχή του, υποδοχή του. Έχει βάλει τη σφαραγίδα του σε πολλές περιοχές της Επιστήμης των Υλικών και της Μηχανικής, ένα σεμνό άνθρωπο, ευχάριστο, συναργάσιμο, με αδαμάντινο χαρακτήρα και ήθος ένα φιλέλληνα. Ο καθηγητής Αλόμπερ Αλταλίτση γεννήθηκε στην πόλη Πλήμουθ της Αγγλίας και είναι πολίτης του Ηνωμένου Βασιλείου και των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών της Αμερικής. Έλαβα το, το δίπλωμα του Bachelor of Arts με τεπένων στη Μετονολογία και Φυσική του 1969 το δίπλωμα Master of Arts και το διδακτορικό στην Επιστήμη των Υλικών και διδακτορικό δίπλωμα Επιστημών από το Πανεπιστήμιο του Cambridge. Είναι διακεκαλυμμένος καθηγητής, όπως ανέφερα, της έδρας H.T. και Jesse Chua της Σχολής Μηχανικών του Τμήματος Επιστήμης των Υλικών και Μηχανολόγων Μηχανικών του Πανεπιστημίου της Καλιφόρνιας στο Berkeley. Διετέλεσε ερευνητή στο Κολέγιο Τσόρτσιλ του Κέμπριτζ, ερευνητή στο Πανεπιστήμιο τη Καλιφόρνια του Μπέρκλεϊ, αναπληρωτή καθηγητή στο MIT, καθηγητή στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Μπέρκλεϊ από το 1982 μέχρι σήμερα. Κατά την περίοδο 2005 έω 2011 υπηρέτησε ω πρόεδρο του Τμήματο Επιστήμη των Ελληνικών και Μηχανική του Πανεπιστημίου του Μπέρκλεϊ. Διετέλεσε σύμβουλος στην κυβέρνηση και στη βιομηχανία, μεταξύ των οποίων στην Alcan, στην Allison, την Boeing, την Chevron, την Exxon, την GE, την GM, την Google, την Grumman Aerospace, την Instrom, στο JPL, στην Northrop Grumman, στο Rockwell, στη Rolls Royce, στο Sun Power, στο Westinghouse και σε άλλα. Στο πεδίο της ιατρικής διετέλεσε σύμβουλος στην Abbott Vascular, 
στην ATS Medical, στην Baxter, στην Calbo Medics, Edward, Guidant, Medical Medstone και στο St. Jude Medical, όπου μελέτησε τη μηχανική ακιαλαιότητα καρδιακών βαλβίδων, ενθοβλεβίων στέντς και άλλων προσθετικών συστημάτων. Είναι σύμβουλο στο Ινστιτούτο του Χονγκ Κόνγκ για προκεχωρημένε σπουδέ και καθηγητή στο World Premier Institute. Τιμητικέ διακρίσει. Είναι μέλο τη Εθνική Ακαδημίας Μηχανικών των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών, NAE. Ξένο εταίρο τη Βασιλική Εταιρεία, FRS, και εταίρο τη Βασιλική Ακαδημίας Μηχανικών του Ηνωμένου Βασιλείου. Ξένο μέλος της Ρωσικής Ακαδημίας Επιστημών, της Βασιλικής Σουηδικής Ακαδημίας Επιστημών και Μηχανικών, ετέρος της Ακαδημίας για την Παραγωγή της Επιστήμης, S και μέλος της Ευρωπαϊκής Ακαδημίας Επιστημών. Έλαβε πληθώρα βραβείων. Θα αναφέρω ε, ελάχιστα, διότι ο, η, ο κατάλογος είναι μέγας. Ε, το Robert Henry Thurston Award της ASME, Highly Cited Researcher το 2021 και το 2022, την ASM, American Society of Metals, Gold Metal, Medal, το William Nix Medal, το Morris Cohen Award, το Acta Materialia Gold Medal Award, το David Τέλλεν Μπουλ Αβουόλντ, το TMS στο Symposium Maker and Nano Understanding Mechanical Behavior Across Length Scales and Structural Materials Division Symposium to his honor. The Erlingen Medal, Society of Engineering and Science, uh, the to, στο Institute of Physics Lecturer και στο Robert Franklin Award, έλαβε το, το award αυτό, ε, είναι ε, fellow της ε, Material Research Society, honorable member από το, απ το 2009 της ε, American Academy for the Advancement of, of Science. Και η λίστα συνεχίζεται με πολλά άλλα επιπλέον, το Sir Alan Cotterell Gold Medal, το οποίο είναι από το International Congress on Fracture, είναι Fellow της American Ceramic Society, Fellow της American Society of Mechanical Engineers, έλαβε το Griffith Medal, Griffith είναι ο ιδρυτής της μηχανικής της θράψεως, τόσο που ξεκίνησε την ιδέα αυτή, το Nadai Medal, είναι Fellow της TMS, Fellow του Institute of Physics στο Λονδίνο, ε, επίτιμο μέλος της Gruppo Italiana Fratura, Italian Group of Fracture. Ε, Τζο, ε, έλαβε το, στο περιοδικό Testing and Evaluation για το Most Outstanding Article, Distinguished Structural Material and Scientist Award, Most Outstanding Scientific Accomplishment Award στα κεραμικά υλικά, από το U.S. Department of Energy είναι Honorary Epitimus Fellow. International Congress of Fracture είναι στο Curtis McGraw Research Award. American Society of Engineering Education. Το E9 Award for Best Presented Paper on Fatigue της ASTM, American Society for Testing and Materials. Fellow της American Society of Materials. Έχει λάβει το George Erwin Medal, το οποίο είναι ένα υψηλό μετάλλιο για την επιστήμη της μηχανικής της θράψεως. Έχει εκλεγεί ένας από τους Americans, Americas Top, τους 100 Young Scientists, most outstanding scientific accomplishments award in metallurgy and so on. Uh, 
Είναι γνωστό για τα σημαντικά του επιτεύγματα στι επιστήμες, στις επιστήμη των υλικών, τη θράψεω και τη κοπόσεω. Έχει δημοσιεύσει πάνω από 800 επιστημονικέ εργασίε, ένα βιβλίο και υπήρξε επιστημονικό εκδότη 19 βιβλίων. Έχει περισσότερε από 86.000 αναφορέ και δίκτυα πήχηση, 113 στη βάση δεδομένων Web of Science, 124 στη βάση Σκόπου και 145 στη βάση Google Scholar. Σχέση του με την Ελλάδα. Ο καθηγητή Αλίτσεκ κατά την τελευταία τρία κονταετία συνεργάζεται στενά με καθηγητέ και αλευγητέ ελληνικών ΑΕΗ, έχει δώσει σειρά διαλέξεων και έχει συμμετάσχει σε διεθνή συνέδρα και συμπόσια που έχουν οργανωθεί στην Ελλάδα. Εν συμπεράσματι, πρόκειται για μια παγκοσμίω εμβέλεια προσωπικότητα στο διεθνέ στερέωμα τη επιστήμη των υλικών, τη θράψεω και τη κοπόσεω, με σημαντική αναγνώριση του επιστημονικού του έργου. Αγαπητέ φίλε και συνάδελφοι Ρόμπερτ, η γνωριμία μα ανάγεται στο έτο 1981, όταν διετέλεσε πρόεδρο τη Διεθνού Εταιρεία Μηχανική τη Θράψεω και διοργάνωσε το ανατεταραετία διεξαγόμενο ένατο συνέδριο στη Χονολουλού τη Χαβάη. Είχα την ευκαιρία να σε ακολουθήσω στα βήματά σου και να διοργανώσω το 13ο συνέδριο του 2017 στη Αλόδο και να εκλεγώ πρόεδρος για την περίοδο 23-27 του 2023 στην Ατλάντα. Και τώρα, μετά από τόσα χρόνια, συναντώμεθα στην Ακαδημία Αθηνών, όπου έχω τη χαρά και την τιμή να παρουσιάσω στον περιορισμένο χρόνο που διαθέτω το έργο σου. Ένα έργο που θα παραμείνει ανεξίτηλα τυπωμένο στην ιστορία της μηχανικής των υλικών. Η Ακαδημία Αθηνών, σε αναγνώριση της μεγάλης συμβολής σου στην επιστήμη, σε υποδέχεται απόψε στους κόλπους της, ευχόμενη, όπως και από τη θέση αυτή του ξένου εταίρου, να συνεχίσεις με το ίδιο πάθος και αγάπη να θεραπεύεις την επιστήμη σου που τόσο ηγάπησες και να συνεργάζεσαι με Έλληνας συναδέλφους. If you were in English, με συγχωρείτε. Dear colleague and friend Robert, According to the protocol of the Academy of Athens, I presented the salient points of your academic career with your outstanding contributions in science in Greek. I'm asking for your understanding. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you in the Academy of Athens, the most prestigious academic institute in Greece. My warmest congratulations. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Ευχαριστούμε, κύριε Δούτε. Dear college, I would like to kindly ask you to proceed to be awarded with the medal and diploma of the Foreign Fellow of the Academy of Athens. Well, thank you very much. Or that was a.
particularly Professor Gudas, thank you for nominating me. And this is a, really a, um, a seminal event in my life. So thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to talk this evening about um, damage tolerance, which means really the resistance to fracture, to failure, uh, and a little bit to the resistance to, um, to deformation, which of course is strength. And I want to look at a whole range of materials, um, starting with natural materials, some biological materials, um, which have rather unique ways of resisting fracture and having strength. And then to look at some of the more modern um, engineering materials where this is uh, paramount. And I'll, so I'm going to take a kaleidoscope view through these different materials. So to begin with, I just want to say a few things about fracture, what I understand is fracture. This is a topic which, of course, Professor Goodis is an expert in as well. So it's, uh, it's an intriguing um, subject to look at. And then I want to look at how certain biological materials behave. I'm interested in skin and bone and a little bit about fish scales. Um, and then to see, to look at how we do it as engineers in two classes of materials. One are ceramic composites, which are now starting to be found in gas turbine engines. Uh, GE in particular and Rolls-Royce to some extent are using parts of their engines made of ceramics, but they're ceramic composites, which have always been very prone to fracture and how they've solved that problem. And then finally, to look at a new class of alloys, which has become literally the rage of material science, which are known as high entropy alloys. So first of all, what is fracture? I mean, what is resistance to fracture? The term is toughness. And a lot of people think toughness and strength are the same thing, but they're actually not. They're quite different. Strong materials often aren't very tough, and tough materials aren't almost very strong. Once again, in all materials except ceramics, strength is resistance to deformation. You can sort of bend it. And toughness is resistance to fracture. I like to think of this two mechanisms, two classes of fracture resistance, and, and I, I talk about extrinsic and intrinsic toughening mechanisms. Uh, intrinsic mechanisms are what you think is the toughness for fracture. It's resistance to failure, damage ahead of a cracked tip. Um, could be dislocations piling up against a, a particle and breaking the particle. It could be voids forming around precipitates or something like that. That is essentially intrinsic toughness. Most ductile materials, metals, are toughened this way. Um, it takes place ahead of the crack tip, as I said before. And the scales, the length scales, are, are typically the order of nanometers. We're talking about dislocation burgers, vectors, and that kind of thing. If you try to do that with a ceramic, it doesn't work. I mean, ductile ceramics is a fun name, but it doesn't mean very much. So in ceramics, you look behind the crack tip, and there's a whole class of mechanisms which are completely different and subject to different aspects of, of microstructure, which shield the crack from the stresses at the crack tip. It's a shielding mechanism. And this can occur typically by mechanisms like crack bridging, um, fibers or grains that interact. I always liken that to if I was talking to you and I put a toffee in your mouth, it'd be more difficult to open and close your mouth. So that's the most important mechanism. There are wedging mechanisms as well. That's like a donut in the mouth, but that's more associated with fatigue and deflecting the crack. If you can deflect the crack off the plane of maximum stress, tensile stresses, you can in induce toughening. So these are the mechanisms that primarily are associated with brittle materials. Um, they take place at or behind the crack tip. They are the, uh, they, as I said, they, they are the way that ceramics can be toughened. And their length scales can be anything. They can vary from nanos, nano, um, nanometers. In bone, they can be hundreds of microns. So that's a very clicking class of mechanisms. But the interesting thing is that the actual um, 
notion of having damage behind the crack tip or resistance behind the crack tip gives rise to something called the resistance curve or R curve. And this is a, an R curve. This is the fracture toughness, toughness of material plotted against the crack extending. And you can see that the toughness will increase as the crack initially extends. And that's due to the fact that as the crack extends, you get more of these mechanisms forming behind the crack tip, which makes it more difficult to move the crack. So um, most people think in terms of um, the crack initiation toughness. Uh, I'll talk about K1C, which is a, the, the stress intensity to initiate a crack. That's the fracture mechanics way of doing things. But of course, there's all this resistance after the crack initiates, when the crack is growing very slowly, and that's what I call crack growth toughness. And both those mechanisms are very important, as long as the cracks remain fairly small. So this, I think, is one of the, the essence of fracture, that you can initiate a crack, and then you can let it grow, but in a rather stable fashion. Now, as I said, ductile materials, generally toughened intrinsically, brittle materials, generally toughened extrinsically. But biological materials seem to develop both of these mechanisms in a rather seamless fashion, which is a very clever way to generate resistance to fracture. And I'll show you some examples of that. So just to do this, we have to look at a lot of length scales because we're dealing with mechanisms at the nanoscale all the way up to quite coarse grain scales. So I'll show you today most of my um, resistance to fracture in the macro scale is done using what's called fracture mechanics, where you put a crack in a sample and you try to break it and you see what resistance it gets. As we go down the length scales, I'll start, I'll show a little bit of in situ synchrotron uh, microscopy where we can actually image cracks in three dimensions. Um, in fact, you can look through ceramics with these techniques. It's an x-ray technique. Um, we do the same thing in this scanning electron microscope. Better accuracy, but it's two-dimensional, the post be three-dimensional. Um, I'll show you a little bit of in situ small angle x-ray scattering, wide angle x-ray diffraction, where we can actually measure the strain in different components in the material. And then finally, of course, electron microscopy, where we can look at the nanoscale and see the actual mechanisms by which these, you know, the processes by which generate these toughening mechanisms. So first bone. Bone's a good one because we're all getting older and our bones are more prone to break. Most people, including the medical community, believe it's due to loss of bone mass, bone mineral density, which of course is true. But there's another mechanism which we think is more important, which is the degradation of the bone itself. It gets less resistant to fracture. Bone has a whole range of length scales. It starts off with uh, basically uh, collagen. The collagen molecules are twisted to form collagen fibrils. Mineral um, hydroxyapatite is deposited on those fibrils. And then they are twisted to form fibers. So we've gone from nanoscale to micron scale. And then as you go coarser, the bone remodels itself. Um, these are called osteons. And in the middle of these are the so-called aversion canals, which take the blood vessels. And, um, and then at the macro scale, you've got the uh, cortical bone uh, on the outside, which I'll mainly talk about, and the um, trabecular bone, which is a sort of a um, much thinner part in the middle. Now, this is a picture of a fracture of bone, and you can see how complicated it is. These sort of circular devices here are the osteons, where the bone remodels, and the middle of those are the aversion canals, which contain the blood vessels. But you can see how the crack will move in a very complicated fashion, which depends on the structure it's seeing. So, um, I did a study of this a few years ago to try and understand what are the various toughening mechanisms in bone. On the left side here are the, are the, um, um, higher, um, so the different, different uh, uh, scales of bone. Again, the tropocollagen molecules, the fibrils, the fibrils, 
and the bone itself. And when we looked at the different mechanisms by which bone resisted fracture, if we look below about a micron scale, now one of the things about bone is it's got all these different length scales, and each one develops a mechanism of toughening. If we look at a lot of engineering materials, we only have two or three length scales. Bone has at least seven, maybe more. And as, as we, we look below a micron, the main mechanism of toughening in bone is what we call the intrinsic mechanism. It's the resistance to fracture. And that resistance to fracture is caused by the collagen being stretched. But it, after it stretches a little bit, it sort of locks, as we call fibril sliding. The, 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 the fibrils, which those collagen twisted molecules with a little bit of mineral in, slide apart. So if, if there's any resistance to that sliding, the material becomes stronger, but it can cut down its ductility and hence its toughness. So um, one of the toughening mechanisms or lack of toughening mechanisms is this fibrillar sliding. As long as the fib fibrils can slide, we're okay. If they lock up, we have a problem. But if we go above about a micron and look behind the crack tip, bone looks like a ceramic. We get lots of micro cracks, um, which are which play a role, but a little bit more complicated. Each one of these micro cracks has these fibrils that bridge the crack, like fibers in a composite. Um, there's little regions between the micro cracks, which give you resistance to fracture, and the cracks can deflect when they hit these osteons, which are the ones I talked about. They run along the axis of the bone. So your arm is easy to split. You can easily split your arm, more difficult to break it, because when you break it, your cracks are hitting these osteons and they deflect because there's a little bit of mineral along the axis of those osteons. So we can see this. This is um, computed tomography in, in the uh, synchrotron. This, these are the osteons. Well, you're actually seeing the Haversian canals almost, but they have mineral along the, ax along the interface. The white region is the crack, and the crack deflects as it encounters these, these osteons. It also twists, and that can give you maybe a factor of two or more increase in toughness. This is um, also looking at, in three dimensions, this is a bone crack, that, that sort of white region's a bone crack, that's the front of the crack. These regions here are the Haversian canals, and anything dark blue is unbroken. And you can see, even though there's a crack here, there's regions of unbroken material. And that unbroken material acts like a bridge. When the crack is like a bit of toffee in your mouth, basically, it makes it more difficult for the crack to open. These don't seem very scientific, I must say, but they're very, very potent. The length scales are quite coarse, but they're extraordinarily potent mechanisms of generating resistance to fracture. So, can we just run Oh, there we go. You can see it, if you can just run it again as well. A crack propagates here, and it, in could you rerun it? Uh, and it encounters an osteon, and you can see as it encounters that osteon, it immediately deflects. You can see little bits of fibers that bridge that osteon. And the result is a complex configuration of tiny cracks, which actually are quite a resistance to fracture. So bone's a fascinating material in that regard. One of the issues with bone is what happens when you get older. We know that bone's more likely to fracture when you get older. As I said, it's due somewhat to loss of bone mass, but it's also due to the resistance to fracture. This is the toughness of bone this, as a function of crack extension, and these are these resistance or R curves. This is the initiation toughness, this is the growth toughness. You can't see much on the initiation toughness, but this is young bone, 30-year-old bone. This is middle-aged bone, 50 to 60-year-old bone. And this is aged bone, which is maybe 80 to 90-year-old bone. All this is human bone. And you can see there's a vast reduction in the toughness for the cracks to grow. So what causes that? Well, again, this, this is a biological material. It has intrinsic, extrinsic toughening. The extrinsic toughening, it's a little difficult to see here, but you can see these, what we call, these little cracks that form parallel to the main crack. 
And they are these uncracked ligaments, so the bridges of the crack. And it turns out that as you get older, the number of osteons that develop in your bone increases. Remember, the boundaries of the osteons are where the cracks deflect. So these little uncracked lig regions are much smaller in young, much larger rather, in young bone because the osteons are further apart. But when you get to older bone, that bridging mechanism is diminished because you have too many osteons. What's the intrinsic mechanism? Well, we use this technique called um, small angle x-ray scattering. We put a little piece of bone in a testing machine in the synchrotron, in the x-ray synchrotron. And we use wide angle x-ray scattering, which focuses on the mineral. Minerals crystallographic, so we can see the strain. That's not so important here. But we can also use small angle x-ray scattering to look at the collagen. Now, the collagen has mineral on it. And it's in a very unique sort of spacing of about 65 nanometers. So we can, that looks like a crystallographic material in terms of scattering. So we can measure the strain in the collagen. Remember, the collagen is the, is the function that causes the deformation. So if we look at this plot here, this is the strain in the material, the strain in the bone, what we just measured. We measure strain. And this is, this, on this axis, is the strain just in the collagen. So if I look at, say, a strain of about 1% in young bone, which is the upper line here, of that 1% strain in the bone, virtually all of it is carried by the collagen, which is what you'd expect because the mineral is too stiff. But if you look at old bone, instead of having most of the strain colored by the collagen, it's way much lower now. Now the strain in the collagen is only about 60% of the strain in the bone. Why is that? Well, it's because the collagen locks and it can't pull apart. And it locks because of things called crosslinks. And these crosslinks, there's a number of different crosslinks, but the ones that are most important are basically due to the accommodation of sugars around your, your parts of your bone, which leads to, they're called um, end products, and they cause the, the bone basically to be unable to slide. So it's, it's like an embrittlement in a metal, and that's the intrinsic mechanism because you reduce the ductility, the deformation that the bone can tolerate for fracturing. Now, it turns out that a lot of these mechanisms play a big role in various diseases of bones. If you have, now one of the top things is if you have bone getting aged with bone, if you have diabetes as well, that makes things much, much worse. And um, forget all the details here, but this, this is now, again, looking at the, fight, the strain in the collagen versus the strain in the tissue itself. And you can see this is sort of, uh, healthy bone, and we're, we're quite high, but if you have diabetic bone, much less bone carried by the, much less strain carried by the collagen, and the reason is that diabetic, uh, and I don't understand all the medical aspects, leads to a lot of cross-linking, which locks this deformation mechanism. Um, just quickly is another mechanism, I've looked at a lot of diseases, but this one is osteogenitor imperfecta, it's brittle bone disease, which children have. Um, and there you get um, a lot of degradation in the toughness of the bone, uh, and you get a lot of mineral formed all over the bone structure. So if we look at tensile tests, this is stress strain curves. Wild type is healthy bone, and these are the bone from mild and uh, severe osteogenitor imperfecta, and you can see that the strength drops dramatically and the, the ductility, the strain it can tolerate dramatically, and that's due to this increased cross-linking, so the bone can't slide. If you look at the extrinsic mechanism, this is the R curve, there are not so much curves here, toughness versus crack extension, the red is healthy bone, and the bone breaks, this is, these are mouse bones, by the way, and they break at 45 degrees because the crack hits those osteons and deflects along that direction. They're not osteons in mouse bone, but they're mineralized regions. But if you look at the 
diseased bone, the crack doesn't deflect. It just goes right through. So you've lost that mechanism. Why? Well, because there's far more mineral in the bone. Instead of all the mineral being in the boundaries of the osteons or the regions, it's spread throughout the bone. So there's no particular need for that b b crack to deflect. And that's seen in a lot of different bone mechanisms. The medical reasons are different, of course, but the loss of toughness is generally due to cross-linking, which limits the intrinsic deformation of the collagen, and the fact that you don't see as much deflection of cracks um, or form bridges in the bone which is either diseased or aged. Fish scales, what about fish scales? Fish scales are intriguing too. We've looked at those because um, in fish scales, they're a little bit like armor. Um, uh, I'm sh I, I know the Romans had this kind of armor, maybe the Greeks did too, but the, the, the idea that these scales are overlapping, which gives them some kind of ductility, the, the fish can you know, move around, but they, they're not just a hard layer. Like your teeth, your teeth has a um, enamel coating, which makes it hard when you, when you chew or what you wear and so forth, but if the whole teeth was made of enamel, it would fracture very easily. So the interior of the teeth is made of, of what's called dentin, which is a similar microstructure, but with far more collagen, which makes it tougher. So you need two, two regions. First, hard region at the surface to prevent something penetrating, and then a lower region which tolerates that additional strain. And of course, fish scales are like that. This is the hard region of a scale. This is of a alligator gar fish. This is, um, has a much, much higher stiffness and a much, much higher strength. It, it's, it's all, in these ones, collagen and mineral, but it's much more mineral up here. And below it, less mineral, mineral more collagen is the tough region. Um, we looked at this in particular in a fish called the Arapaima giga, which is a fish in the Amazonian rivers, which survives, has survived for eons in the presence of piranha, which are, of course, known to be very aggressive and hard-bearing um, fish. We actually took a piranha tooth and did a hardness indent by pushing it into the material. But you can see here that when we look at that lower level, which has got the hardness, which has got the resistance to fracture, the collagen is in a spiral staircase type arrangement. It, it reminds me of a Liberace uh, spiral staircase. And, and it's got this twisted, it's called a boulagan structure. These are not perfect boulagans. But what's intriguing is when you put this in the um, synchrotron and look at the, do the small angle scattering, these layers of collagen will actually rotate to carry more of the load. It's a very interesting mechanism. It's seen a lot of biological materials. Um, but the, the collagen will basically rotate and carry more of those. You can see it here. Um, it starts off like this and it gradually rotates to carry the load. And this is a very, very effective mechanism of resisting fracture in the lower levels of these, um, of these uh, fish scales. You can see a picture of it here. Um, this is the crack, but you'll see all these cross fly lines of, that, that inter interact very effective way. It's, the layers are rotating and they're interacting that causes a great deal of toughness. Most fish today have um, what's called a single boulagan, but if you look at some of the, the fossilized fish, they have actually, actually have double boulagans where they have two layers in opposite directions that rotate in the same level. These are actually even tougher, but they're much less flexible. So the fish is not so flexible, but it's much, much more likely to survive heavy penetration by a predator. And it turns out, by the way, that, that the, the toughness of, of the Arapaima scale, we did a, this is a fracture test here, is, this is um, the toughness is a function of the stiffness or modulus for all different materials. And Arapaima scales are some of the toughest materials you can find. In fact, in terms of flexible materials, they are probably the toughest um, biological material. Very, very interesting way of generating resistance to fracture. Another one that's very interesting is skin. 
skin is almost impossible to, to break. In fact, there's a, there's a hang glider in California that actually jumps off high buildings or, or, or in Yosemite with the wings attached to its skin. And if you do it in the right way, it won't tear. And this is, a, it's generally the, the so-called dermis layer. You can see how a piece of skin fails. It just tears open in a very, very elongated fashion. It doesn't break like bone. Um, it's a picture of one here, and you'll see it takes forever to break. What happens? Well, in skin, you've got collagen, and the collagen is not, it's, it's a collagenous material, not much mineral, but the collagen is twisted and it's curled. And what happens when you pull it? First of all, it uncurls, and then it rotates by that mechanism I talked about, rotating towards the development of fracture. And then these are all fibers, and then the fibers separate into the individual fibrils. This is a very, very powerful mechanism of resisting fracture. And you can see the initial condition of the, of the skin is all the collagen is sort of twisted. But after you basically pull it, it will again extend, um, unravel, and then align itself, rotate, and finally separate. So a very effective mechanism. Of course, it, it, there are certain directions in skin which are more resistant, and that's used in surgery, but I, I won't talk about that now. Now, to change the subject, what about engineering materials? What, what's happening there? Well, I think the two biggest things that have happened in recent times in terms of the damage tolerance of materials has been the um, adoption of ceramics in, in gas turbine engines. We've always wanted to have ceramics. They're much lighter. They have a much higher temperature range, much higher temperature range than metallic alloys like nickel-based super alloys, but they're brittle. I mean, if you, if a bird, you, you, if you ingest a bird into an engine, you'd shatter a ceramic engine, and that would be the end of it. But now companies like GE in particular, and others are following, are putting in ceramic composites where you reinforce the ceramic with a fiber of the same material. They use silicon carbide fibers and silicon carbide material. The silicon carbide still breaks, but the fibers are very weakly bonded, so they act as a bridge. And then, so you have, a, once the matrix is broken, the fibers still hold the material together, so you don't get a immediate fracture. You get a little bit like you would in a metal. You see, de see apparent deformation, apparent ductility before fracture. And these are, these are now being used in the, some of the engines that are going to be that are being used in the, um, the Dreamliner, the 787, and in the new um, 777X um, Boeing plane, there's this LEAP engine, which is a, has a lot of ceramic components. They're not rotating blades, but the stationary blades, like the vanes or the um, seals, which are with a blade, and, and the uh, coatings of, on the, the combustors are now made of these ceramic and ceramic materials. So how do you look at these materials? They can operate at very high temperatures. In current gas turbine engines, they're probably 1,200 degrees centigrade, but they potentially can go to 15, 1,600 degrees. So how do you study the mechanisms in this? So we developed a system um, which is, it goes in the synchrotron where we have a little a testing machine basically here. This is a, a loading machine here, um, and we can measure the stress and strain just like a regular testing machine. But we shine the X ray beam through the machine, through a window, and we can take tomography images of the material. We can look right through the material, which is very, very interesting. And so um, this is what it looks like. This is the machine. You can see the light because we heat the material with, with um, what's called a heat lamp, so we can go from room temperature to 2,000 degrees in about 10 seconds. And we're looking at a nominally macroscopic region. And uh, so you can see the sample in there. This could be a tensile sample, uh, or it could be a, 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 just a tensile or bend sample. This, was, this is data on actually on a pyrolytic graphite, which is a nuclear material. I won't talk about that. But in these ceramic composites, this is what you can see. This is the stress-strain curve or the load displacement curve. And we can actually 
measure the stress strain curve while at the same time looking through the material and seeing all the damage. And what you're seeing there are all the fibers that reinforce the material. The red regions here are where they've broken and we can see the amount of pullout. And you can see generating cracks here and, and cracks along here. So there's a, you can see, everything you see in that picture can be basically measured and uh, so we know every, every position of every fiber and how much deformation there is. That's at room temperature, okay, big deal. But if you do it, we can actually do it at 1700 degrees centigrade. This is the same um, uh, situation, but the same material, but now we're at extremely high temperatures, 1750. We can't, we're not looking through it now, but you can see for every part of load, you can see the damage and you see those fibers that are holding the crack together. And that's the basis of the toughness of these materials, that they can tolerate, they won't just break catastrophically, which is a disaster, they are held together by this bridging. So it's a really powerful, how else would you look at that? You'd have to cool, you couldn't have a look at that temperature normally, you'd have to cool it down, cut the sample open and see what's happening. We can see this now in real time at temperature under load. So there's distinct differences in the, um, in the, the room temperature, this one and the high temperature, single crack which then breaks room temperature, multiple cracks, but we can get lots of information. This is, this is slightly different imaging, same materials, same samples we looked at. You can see the fibers here. We're not looking at pullout now, but these red, these colored regions represent the cracks and the color here represents the width of the crack, what's called the opening displacement. And that can be used to measure the toughness in these regions. So this is a very, very powerful way of getting information of a damage mechanism or resistance to, to damage at temperature under those conditions. So this has been extremely useful for trying to predict how long these materials will last under the given situations. We can even, we can get all the data, every bit, everything you can see on these pictures, we can basically um, um, know exactly what the numbers, where it is, size, movement and everything. We can even look at, um, sorry, we can even look at actually oxidation. Another, oh, is this, uh, another one of these materials happens to make the fibers move so they can pull out a little bit to give you more resistance. They coat them with boron nitride. The trouble is the boron nitride starts to move, the boron moves, and it can cause cracks. Oh gosh, sorry about this. It can cause cracks, these, these little green lines here, around the, the um, in the coating of the fiber and once the cracks form and these fibers sort of loosen from their coating there's no more resistance and so you've lost the toughness because they just sort of pull out. So we can see all this oxidation that takes place and where it's occurring and this is and you can see exactly where these cracks form. They form in the boronites and nitride coatings. Okay let me finalize by talking about what is probably the biggest thing that's happened in material science in the last, in structural material science in the last uh, a couple of decades, and that's high entropy alloys. Most, most alloys have one element in them, iron, steel, ni nickel in super alloys. But then about 20 years ago, people started to put lots of elements in, and often in equiatomic situations. And so um, one of the alloys of interest was this chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, five different elements, all with different crystal structures, but they form a single phase material, which is phase center cubic, which is very, very interesting. You'd expect to see nasty intermetallics. And so this set up a whole new uh, range of studies on these multiple element materials. The name high entropy alloy is stuck. There's nothing particularly important about the entropy, but it's their multiple principal element materials. So we looked at these quite early on, and one of the things, this is looking at a three-component material with chrome, cobalt, nickel, 
And what we find is this is the stress strain curve. And you can see we go from brown, green to blue, room temperature to liquid nitrogen temperatures. As the material gets cooler, it gets harder. Well, we kind of expect that, but it also gets more ductile. Most materials get more brittle at lower temperatures, but these get more ductile, and they have incredible ductility at liquid nitrogen temperatures. We look at the R curves, so these are things on the toughness, and the toughness rises to massive amounts. In this material, the toughness gets as high as 273 megapascal root meters at liquid nitrogen temperatures. That doesn't mean much to many of you, but the toughness of steel at most would be 100 megapascal meters. The toughness of silicon is one megapascal meters, and these materials are up at 273. So they're fascinating materials, and it's caused by, and I won't go through all the details, but it's caused by this region here, which is called strain hardening. Strain hardening hardens the material. The things that move deformation of dislocations, and there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms here, um, the, some of these dislocations coming in are arrested at the boundaries that are formed. They're called twin boundaries. Um, but the twin boundaries, that, that increases the strength. But if we look at this picture on the third side here, you can see these are the twin boundaries, but the twin boundaries also are highways for these dislocations to move. So we generate strength and we generate them. Ductility. And that's often difficult to do, but the combination is toughness. So these materials have these tremendous strain hardening regions, which harden the material, but this is the point when it basically fails by necking, so it delays the onset of fracture. So we've got a good combination of, of, of properties. Um, there's lots of different mechanisms we see this, we've done these are all transmission electron microscopy mechanisms. These are actually done at low temperatures where we can see the twinning where these, these um, bands are formed and they twin across. We can see these are these dislocations moving down slip bands or arrested by slip bands and then generating deformation across them. So there's lots of interesting mechanisms, but the key is we generate strength, we generate ductility, hence we generate toughness. Now we can do the same things at very, very low, high strain rates. These are done at strain rates as high as, uh, this is a, a 10 to the minus 3 per second is just pulling it like you would do normally. But we can do it in what's called a Hopkinson bar at extremely high, sorry I'm jumping again, extremely high strain rates of about um, 8 orders of magnitude faster. And that's like going to super low temperatures. And again, we see all these interesting mechanisms. We see these twins. We see um, transformation to form another phase. We see stacking vaults. These are all mechanisms that promote the strain hardening. Very, very interesting. And we've even gone, and in fact, this material has one of the highest, uh, t if this is a form of toughness compared to all other materials. The, the strength of these materials jump up to four gigapascals. It, these high strain which is an enormous strength. Um, we've done this under with uh, laser shock straining. We're now up another 10, another up to 10 to the 7, so we're about 10 orders of magnitude faster. And we see all these interesting deformation mechanisms which generate strength and ductility. We've even gone to liquid helium temperatures, and we've we've seen the same thing. We get these planar slip bands, we get forming of what's called stacking faults, we get twinning, we get the formation of another phase. But the interesting thing is that this material, this three component chrome cobalt nickel has a toughness of above 500 mechanisms, 500 megapascal root meters at, at uh, liquid helium, which is the highest toughness ever measured. So these are really interesting materials. They're very, but they have peculiar properties, but the one of these are the face centered cubic ones and they have the highest toughness of any materials. I'm running out of time, so let me just say we've also looked at a material called the BC body centered cubic, which are refractory. These go to very, very high temperatures. And these are a different class of materials in so much that they're very brittle. So how can we deal with that? They have very high temperature properties. This is this, this, their strength as a function of temperature. Current materials sort of peak out about 1,200. These materials could go up to 
15, 1600 degrees centigrade. They're interesting for things like hypersonics. They're interested for possibly using in gas turbine engines, but they're brittle, very, very brittle. And you can see here, everybody tests them in compression so they have good properties. If you press them in tension where the cracks open, the, the, these ductilities are less than 1%, less than 0.1%, whereas the previous systems I showed you had 90% ductility. So they're, they're quite a challenge. We have managed to generate an alloy now, which this is called a niobium, tantalum, titanium, hafnium. I think it's going to appear in science this week, but this has very, very good toughness. Very, very strange for that reason. It doesn't have any strain hardening like the other systems I showed you had, very different, but it generates something called kink bands, which are Orowin, one of the people who invented the dissertation, suggested this about 70 years ago, that kink bands could be interesting. No one's really seen much about kink bands, and there are dislocations that get together and cause the material to kink. So they generate a lot of strain, and this has been very effective for toughness. So this, this alloy doesn't have the very high temperature properties we'd like, but it has remarkable toughness for a body center cubic material. So let me finish by saying I've looked at various different ways you can in generate resistance to fracture. I've talked about this notion of intrinsic versus extrinsic toughening. Intrinsic due to plasticity, head of the crack tip, generally from ductile materials. Extrinsic toughening, nothing to do with plasticity, all to do with shielding of the crack by mechanisms like bridging and deflection. Um, the intrinsic toughening mechanisms really are the ones that are generated in these new high entropy alloys, which are remarkably tough because they can generate that. The extrinsic toughening pertain to ceramics, which can't, you can't have much plasticity there. And they're the ones that have allowed us to make these ceramic composites now, which are going to be used in gas turbine engines. It's interesting. And planes today have plastic airframes, like the Dreamliner, and now they have ceramic engines, so maybe it's time to take the train. Um, and then, of course, um, in biological materials, biological materials, I've never worried about this, they can have both mechanisms which they seamlessly connect across length scales. So it's a, I think it's a very intriguing thing. Um, most of these other mechanisms were not invented because of, of biological materials, but I think we've managed to simulate what biological materials has been doing for eons by combining these two classes, very different classes of toughening materials. Thank you very much. Dear colleague, we would like to congratulate you on your very interesting speech. The Academy of Athens welcomes you and wishes you every success in the, in the continuation of your work. Let us see this.